Hello, you're watching Middle East Matters on France 24. I'm Sharon Gaffney and here's what's coming up in this week's show. Discriminatory, cruel and arbitrary, human rights groups accuse Israeli authorities of trying to isolate Palestinians from the rest of the world by introducing tough new restrictions on the entry of foreigners into the West Bank. It's an industry worth about a billion dollars a year. Cosmetic surgery is booming in Iran, with hundreds of thousands of people crossing the border from Iraq to undergo procedures. And while high temperatures and low rainfall present challenges for growers, Egypt is making big strides towards reviving an industry first established under the rule of the ancient pharaohs. It's now one of the Middle East's leading wine producers. Good to have you with us. Well, first this hour, the Israeli army has this week conceded that one of its soldiers likely shot Palestinian-American reporter Shirin Abu Akli. A final investigation into the killing of the Al Jazeera journalist who died while covering an Israeli raid in May found that she'd been mistaken for a militant. Her family says Israeli authorities are refusing to take responsibility for her murder. Jenny Shin has the details. Concluding a months-long investigation, the Israeli army said there was high possibility that Al Jazeera journalist Shireen Abu Akhle was accidentally killed by their own fire. Al Jazeera denounced the Israeli statement, accusing the army of evading responsibility. This report says that there's a very high possibility that the Israeli army were the ones who fired the shots. But it leaves the door open to misinformation and keeping the issue vague. It's clear that the aim is to try to escape from responsibilities. The Palestinian-American journalist was shot in the city of Jenin on May 11th while covering a raid in the occupied West Bank. She was wearing a press vest and helmet when she was gunned down. A household name in the Arab world, Abu Akleh covered Israel's occupation of the Palestinian territories for over 25 years. Her killing caused global outrage and calls for an investigation which Israel has refused. Separate probes by various bodies, including the UN, human rights groups and media organizations have all found Israeli fire to be responsible for the reporter's death. Abu Akleh's family has vowed to press for an ICC investigation, saying they won't stop until they have justice. The Israeli army has meanwhile denied Abu Akleh was deliberately targeted, adding that its soldiers had acted according to their rules of engagement. Staying in the region, Israeli authorities are pushing to impose new restrictions on foreigners who wish to visit or live in the West Bank. Rights groups say the measures will have serious consequences for thousands of people who are married to or in relationships with Palestinians. The regulations, which were due to come into effect this week, have now been amended and their implementation delayed until October after being challenged in the courts. Well, for more, we're joined now from Jerusalem by one of those who took that case, Jessica Montana. Executive Director of the Israeli NGO, Amoked, thanks so much for your time. Firstly, Israeli authorities, they issued a revised text on Sunday. They have dropped some of the more contentious elements from these regulations. Tell us, what were they initially proposing and what's been amended? So these are regulations governing the entrance of all foreigners to the West Bank. Anyone who is not an Israeli or not a Palestinian is governed by these regulations. If you want to come just for a short visit, if you want to work or volunteer or study in the West Bank, or if you are married to a Palestinian and want to live here with your family. And all aspects for all of these populations, the new regulations are much more restrictive than what was enforced previously. You're not allowed to use the Israeli airport. Most people have to apply in advance for permits. Whole categories of people are not even able to come uh, for any reason. So uh, what they have amended in response to our objections, uh, I don't know whether to call it cosmetic or maybe slightly more than that. Some of the most outrageous elements of the proposal. There was a quota on foreign students coming to Palestinian universities for no obvious reason. They have removed this quota. But the most of the elements of the procedure are the same, and the implications are that it will be very difficult to work or study or volunteer 
in Palestinian institutions and for tens of thousands of people who are married to Palestinians, it will basically be impossible to live with your spouse in the West Bank. And authorities are now saying that this will be a two-year trial once it's introduced. So the situation remains fluid. Do people still risk being arbitrarily denied entry? And what's next for your legal challenge? That's continuing, I presume. Yes, I mean, the two-year trial period is, this is standard practice of the Israeli military, you know, to see, let's say, what they can get away with, uh, how much pressure there will be both, uh, you know, from organizations in the courts and from the international community. Already it's clear, uh, you know, there will be discrimination, for example, uh, a French national who also has Moroccan or Jordanian uh, passport will no longer be allowed to come to the West Bank. So this is an issue that France, that the international community should continue to be speaking out. I mean, some of the more outrageous things that were removed were thanks to this outcry also from the international community. So we will continue the challenge in the Israeli courts, but it's crucial also that uh, friends of Israel around the world continue to speak out and uh, demand that they respect their rights under international law, under the reciprocal arrangements, visa arrangements with Europe and the United States to allow Palestinian society to uh, enjoy cooperation with the outside world. OK, thank you so much for your time this week, Jessica. That's Jessica Montel, Executive Director of the Israeli NGO Amoked. Thanks again for joining us. Thank you. Well, it has one of the world's highest rates of cosmetic surgery, with an estimated quarter of a million women undergoing procedures in Iran each year. It's also increasingly attracting patients from across the Middle East, particularly from neighbouring Iraq, who are drawn by affordable rates and highly skilled surgeons. From Tehran, Reza Saya and our team of correspondents sent this report. The voice of Lebanese pop singer Nancy Azram blasts from the loudspeakers in this operating room in central Tehran, a way of putting Nazrin Davoudi at ease after she travelled from neighbouring Iraq to get her nose done. Iran is really famous for precision when it comes to cosmetic surgery. It was the videos I saw on YouTube and Instagram showing the work done by the doctors that convinced me. 23-year-old Zara Amiri has also come from Iraq for her second operation so far this year. My previous surgery in Iran was a positive experience compared to Iraq. The doctor is very professional and very precise. Highly skilled surgeons, modern equipment for a low-cost operation. 300,000 medical tourists flock to Iran every year, most of them from Iraq. That's up from just 20,000 15 years ago, and last year alone it generated over a billion dollars. With the US sanctions hitting the country, the government is pushing for more facilities to attract even more tourists. It's Dr. Hamid Haslani's third operation this morning. With travel restrictions now lifted, patients from across the Arab world are back. About 20% of uh, all of my patients are from uh, neighbors like Iraq, uh, Qatar, Kuwait, uh, Emirates. And uh, in relation to the, for example, countries in Europe, uh, the cost is lower. The cost is lower and I think the quality is higher. The government has also set up a training course for travel agents to familiarize them with the practices on offer for tourists. Over the past two years, because of COVID-19, we had the lowest number of tourists. After the pandemic ended, people came back to Iran. There are many flights, the border is open, and there's no need for a visa. One issue remains, though. Foreigners can't pay for the surgery by bank cards due to the lack of international banking between Iran and the rest of the world. Finally, for now, it's a tradition that dates back to the third millennium BC, playing an important role in ancient Egyptian ceremonial life. A thriving winemaking scene was set up in the Nile Delta during the time of the pharaohs. And while the modern industry is relatively small scale on an international level, Egypt is now one of the main wine producers within the Middle East. From just outside Cairo, Edouard Dropsy, Matthew Thompson and Justine Babin sent this report. 
It's 10 o'clock in the morning and labourers are hard at work in this vineyard to the north of Cairo. Here they grow 10 or so different varieties of grape, for the most part those well adapted to the harsh conditions like the excessive heat and much more besides. This agricultural engineer has come to inspect this year's crop. The problems that we find growing grapes in Egypt are the high levels of salt in the earth and in the water. We chose this part of Katatba because the salt levels in the earth aren't very high. And as for the water, it's between 200 and 500 parts per million. It's very well suited to growing grapes. If the vines are found in the north of the country, you have to go to Guna, an upmarket resort on the Red Sea, to watch them be turned into wine. It's here that Labib Kalas has chosen to call home. He spent two decades painstakingly developing Egyptian wines. I'll admit that there are limits here. We'll never be able to make a great Egyptian wine on the same level as the great European wines. We know there is lots holding us back in this country. Imported wines are subject to a 3,000% customs tariff. That's a very good thing for wine producers and people who live here, and tourists take advantage of that to buy Egyptian. And in the trendy bars of Guna, there's a willing market. At this private party, it's Egyptian wine on the tables. It's very affordable and it's not sweet. For me, it's important to have a well-balanced wine. I've tried the wine several times and I think it's getting much better in terms of taste. Focused on a domestic market largely aimed at tourists, Egyptian wine is still little known outside the country. But producers still hope the sector will mature and attract more international pairings. Well, that's it for this edition of Middle East Matters. Thanks for watching and do stay tuned for more world news here on France 24. Pollution from the oil business is devastating Gabon. Activists are speaking out about constant leaks. Du pétrole brut s'écoulait dans la, la nature sur un rayon de plus de 400 à 500 mètres. But what's behind these successive spills? Our observers in Gabon bring you first-hand accounts of an environmental catastrophe. Don't miss The Observers on France 24 and France24.com.